for the Economic and Social Council at the UN. And we, in the year 2000, we launched the, at the request of the Economic and Social Council and Secretary General Kofi Annan, we launched the first UN ICT task force for development. And uh, I had the pleasure of being its executive director for five years. And that was in the year 2001. In the year 2000, Ambassador uh, uh, Vibi Sono of Indonesia, who was the president of ECOSOC, decided with the Bureau to pick up this theme of ICT for development. United Nations was not tuned in to the internet revolution at that time. Uh, and uh, this was the first time that it was discussed uh, in the UN. And we innovated a little bit also for the first time to invite in the ECOSOC itself uh, CEOs of the private sector companies to come and join the ministers from developing countries and developed countries and talk together in a dialogue on how to promote development, digital development in developing countries so that countries can plug in to the new internet and uh, develop their economies on a faster pace and be part of this internet revolution. And uh, I must say that uh, that was a quite an uh, uh, eye-opening experience for diplomats at the UN, because the CEOs uh, of Nokia, for instance, uh, uh, Mr. Ir Irma Agole was there, and <clears throat> the CEO of uh, HP was there, and, and so many others. And they, they presented their vision of how information technology can transform development. And the ministers and ECOSOC then said, okay, then we would like to do this together with the private sector. And that was the first time that uh, the ICT task force was constituted in a way that one third of its members were high level government representatives, either ministers and some of them were presidents, the president of Costa Rica Mr. Uh, he, was, he was the chairman of the, of the task force. And we had CEOs from uh, IT companies and NGOs. And the three groups were co-equals. So there were 36 members and the task force worked for, for five years to go into developing countries to mobilize not only the governments but the private sector and the civil society to transform the environment, first of all, the policy environment, the policy framework that needed to be created, and to bring investment to Africa and to Latin America and uh, uh, the Asian region. And I must say that after five years, between 2001 and 2006, this effort was made. And what you see, what happened in mobile telephony, the revolution that took place in uh, bringing mobile telephony access to Africa in particular, but also to South Asia and other countries, was quite successful. And uh, in five years or six years, the rate of penetration of mobile telephony in Africa uh, increased from about 3 to 4 percent to almost 50 percent. So that was a quite a remarkable transformation. And at that time, we con convened Connect Africa. And today, I'm very proud to say 
that now we, can, we have a, an initiative in Africa called Smart Africa, that that generation of connection, connectivity has moved on to smartness, which means that you can create now applications and uh, innovations in Africa and in other developing countries, which can go far beyond the uh, basic connectivity. So this initiative that we have today is really uh, another uh, application that can be now used to transform education, health, environment, whatever the sector is. Now we have new generation of technologies like the blockchain technology that is the uh, second generation of internet which can be used and the e-center is another example of that. And there are many other uh, social media that, uh, that can be used for, uh, for technology, although there are also challenges that have emerged. So what, we are, what I'm saying is that this, 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 the title of this section, this, uh, uh, this part of the event today, is called, called Towards Digital World. But I must say that this is a new digital world, a new digital age that is now taking place. And I must say that we are very proud that the United Nations played a very important role in making this happen. Although United Nations is not usually seen as an organization which can uh, contribute to this kind of uh, transformation, but did, it did contribute very significantly. And there was this summit on World Summit on Information yeah. Society that took place in 2005, which helped to uh, mobilize uh, the private sector and the governments to come, to come together and make, uh, make the things happen. Although we have made a lot of progress, but a lot needs to be done. And therefore, we have this wonderful chance to look at what can be done today. And with our Pier Paolo and our colleagues from Milan, we will start the presentation now. Uh, Mr. I would like to introduce uh, our two colleagues, Mr. Giulio Paleri and Paolo Giancane, who will make a presentation on the World Food Security E-Center, which is not just World Food Security, but it can be much more than that. Mr. Uh, Valeri, you have the floor. Thank you very much to Sar Bulan Khan for his, for his deep and motivated presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Giulio Valeri, CEO of Software Solutions in Milano, Italy, and uh, ECT advisor of uh, Occam. It is my first time in the United Nations, and I would like to thank uh, Occam President Pierpaolo Saporito for giving me this beautiful opportunity. Uh, together, my colleague, uh, Paolo Giancana, board member of finance director of, uh, at Vesenda, producer of, of a platform, Elegere, will present you the project Food and Health Security Center developed by Ocam. The core of this project is to use innovative services and technology to support countries to develop adequate, rapid, and efficient food security and safety, safety policies. Uh, this diagram summarizes how this multi-level support was achieve, achieved. In the center, there is the village, and the support network has been developed around. The first level is the district in the village, the second level, the local institution in the country, and the third level, the service providers, center of excellence, located in different countries in the world. These are only some fields of application for which the platform was created to manage the development and solve problems of uh, agriculture, animals, food, water, plants, irrigation, telemedicine, and human nutrition. Service users of developing countries will be able to benefit from the skills achieved by the service providers in order to transfer knowledge solutions, and enable faster skill development. Internet of Things, IoT, wearable technologies, and mobile devices are the new frontier of digital solutions and are widely so used by the World Food and Health Security Center platform. The information collected integrates advanced data processing such 
such as big data, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, and smart contracts like Bitcoin, blockchain, The Poverty Hub connects users with mobile devices, automated robotic systems and sensors to the network of specialized laboratories and centers of excellence. <coughs> the Italian Association of Agricultural Science Societies, AISA, supports the Ocam project with all its expertise in different fields. As you can see, they can give help with uh, all their experience. Now I turn to Vicente and Paolo, who is going to briefly provide you with an example of a workflow of an end user requested to district the national centers and service providers to solve a problem. Uh, thank you, Giulio. Thank you, President Saporito. And thanks to all of you. Um, I'll be happy to explain how the software at the center of the hub works. I'm not a technical person, so I'm not going to be into too many details. I'll be using layman's words. Uh, my, my goal is to provide an example of how the workflow of information is actually transferred across the different users and then to the service providers. Uh, so we, uh, as Julio mentioned, we got different players, uh, the, and we'll see how the request starts with the end user. So, for example, it could be a farmer or any person habilitated by the system to work through the, uh, the channel of information. So, for example, the end user inserts request information through the mobile application, <coughs> takes a picture or whatever he think is important to be transferred across the system, and submit the request. So that's the role of the end user. The end user, we can think of a, a farmer in respect to an agricultural problem, or a doctor on the grounds needing to inform the rest of the players in the system across the workflow management of data. So the end user will uh, shoot a picture, so take a picture and send to the district within any geographical um, localization. The district service validates the request, could validate the request, and insert further information. For example, notes or attachments. Provides initial feedback, and if the district, at the district level the problem can be solved there, then a solution is being sent back to the end user. Otherwise, the district organization can share the the information received from the end user plus any additional documentation to the national center. So what I wanna highlight here that the information are actually transferred or shared across the channel, not through email system. So all information are actually available through the workflow management, through the technology that we have made or we will be made available for this process without any sort of email or transfer. So they are automatically through the system available well, um, or mobile basically on the cloud. And, um, and whoever is in charge of the whole process can decide the level of integration, can decide the level of engagement by the different players. So it's very important to highlight that the organizational level at the term, in terms of corporate governance, there is total centralization of information and total control from the uh, the authority, the local authority in charge of the process. The National Center, so the National Center analyzes the request topic, monitors the environment, can basically assess the information in conjunction with other potential requests. So if the request comes from um, a, a doctor in a specific hospital, can analyze the information in the context of other uh, similar or different uh, inputs validate the request again, and it may add additional information to the process, provides additional feedback, and then submit the request to the service provider. The service providers may be local organizations like hospitals, national centers for, for agriculture, which are basically those solving 
a problem when deemed so by the national center. So the, the role of the service provider. The service provider eventually analyzes the problem as received, provides diagnosis feedback, sends an initial solution to the national centers and then the district centers, share results, and all the information are in the data, the knowledge accumulated through the process, basically will or can be connected to any intelligence service such as artificial intelligence or machine learning. So all the information basically circulating through the system will be the base for new knowledge. So this system is not intended to be artificial intelligence, but can be easily connected to any application and reaching information and knowledge. And now, uh, please, Julius, so we will launch a video where basically the process that I described earlier is shown to you. So the user identifies itself, add a request, specify the kind of information or the problem he believes he's facing. And, um, and eventually, it will take a picture. We'll take a picture, we'll uh, record the message. So the system is intended to be, in this case, you will see it's taking a picture of a um, plant which is attacked by a part war. See, a picture, a picture is taken, then transmitted to the Info Poverty Hub in real time. In this specific example, we have a kind of mock experience through a video, voice recognition. The way information is shared across the app is multiple. So that's the way we think the knowledge can be shared across the system. Now I will turn to the video from the perspective of those receivers of the information and the district national centers, service providers, who manage the information and reach the information and bring back the information in the system to create learning. So the, the first video we saw from the perspective of the end user, see now from the perspective of the different steps, district, national, and service provider. In this specific case, the district center received the picture, makes a decision in respect to the importance of the picture, and then if the <coughs> issue is deemed important, is sent across. <coughs> Rather than sent across, is shared, because there is no actual transfer of knowledge, but it's a share of knowledge. The system also allows to geolocalize all the requests. To open the request, to check the nature of the problem and then passing to the national center for future decision making. Okay. So the national center receives a notification in respect to the problem. We receive uh, uh, the request from the end user through the different <laughs> Uh, district and centers, and this request is basically classified by type, theme, subject, period, location, districts, the way the national center deems appropriate. So what I want to emphasize is what you see there is an example of how we might you know, organize the, the, the management of information, but it's going to be the local institution with knowledge of the grounds to decide how the information or the problem is actually uh, classified. So the service provider, we eventually will share all this information through the platform to enrich the platform through intelligence services, again, like machine learning. And I don't know if you want to... Uh, use the example of the Magnolia, yeah. because it's, it's an example, but actually can be easily referred as a practical issue faced by... It's true. The choice of the Magnolia is not accidental. 
In Africa, because of a parasite, a large amount of magnolia, magnolias have become ill and no pesticide could stop the epidemic. And every time the parasites become stronger and more voracious. Several specialists in the world were then asked and, so, and one of these, after careful analysis, identified that the parasite that ate only the leaves of magnolia came from South America, probably present in some not disinfesting plants from those countries, where, however, it had an antagonist, a bee, but only, only its larvae. So these bees were imported, reproduced in large numbers, packed in bags, and threw by airplanes in the territory where there were the magnolias. In this way, the epidemic has been stopped. This confirms that the sharing of knowledge through the current ease of communication can make it possible to quickly and effectively solve problems all over the world. And I have to add, without pesticide, in this way we have found a natural way to kill a parasite. Uh, the colleague of Accra who has followed the story in the fifth person can give you more details. Uh, and, uh, your uh, colleague has told about this story some days ago. Okay. Uh, I just want to summarize a few key features of the Info Poverty Hub. So why is this application different than other you may have heard of? Uh, first of all, we're not going to uh, replace the idea of the old hub is to bring different tools together. So it's not machine learning, but it can be easily connected to machine learning. So the idea of the hub is about technology who can, which can get different tools working together towards you know, the satisfaction of needs of those less fortunate than us. So in particular, the possibility to use any system, we're talking about desktop, tablet, and mobile, web with smart data input. So the data can be inserted along with images, text, voice recognition with geolocalization, which is very important, especially with large uh, regions. Users can be easily profiled with secure access. So it can be easily centralized and decentralized and easily uh, identified who is and how the information is actually entered and managed with the, along with data history tracking. We have a, uh, the platform envisage a web database to store any sort of information and georeference data entry with geovisual data navigation. Uh, data collection is centralized, meaning the, the, the local governments or the central government has all the time control of the information and can decide how the flow of information is shared and transferred across the chain. Interoperability with external tools. So, uh, if the organization, the constituency, uh, decides to move forward to implement this, the Info Poverty Hub, whatever investment in IT is already in place, doesn't necessarily have to be replaced. So it can be easily connected to the app. So this is a connector of tools. And interoperability with uh, Internet of Things and intelligent services. So that's the, that's the beauty of the, the, the solution which, for which we show a video in respect to, the, to agriculture and food, but can be easily transferred to health issues and links and benefit from existing technology on the ground. Um, this summary slide, I represented the same project realized by Ockham. Uh, Dagara in Ethiopia, Villa El Salvador in Peru, San Salvador Norte, Republica Dominicana, San Baina in Madagascar, Navajo Organ Center, Maho Bong uh, Lesotho, Mesa El Jabal uh, in South Lebanon, Sam uh, Rabon uh, in Honduras, Borgi et Tuil uh, Tunisia, and Yerapa in Ghana. These are all things realized. So, Ockham is uh, constructor of these things is not only talking about this opportunity they realize this 
opportunities. Um, here is uh, how the summary of this uh, proposal. And uh, we have uh, to, uh, to say that uh, somebody has to ask how much it costs this sort of uh, application and this sort of proposal. And what I want to say today is that it costs one dollar. One dollar for each person in the country uh, in which it will be implemented. This is a consideration we have done with uh, our current president, Pier Paolo Saporito, and we try to finalize uh, our proposal, our projects in, uh, in this way. Thank you very much for your patience and for your interest. And we are here for any other sort of explanation about uh, this uh, application. And uh, here we have the phone with which, uh, where we have realized uh, the app that is ready and uh, uh, it's possible to, to use it to see how it works. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, what attracted me to this uh, initiative and this platform is the interoperability, despite the centralized data collection system, and scalability, which means that it can be integrated and scaled up into the existing technologies and platforms that may be operating in any country, and that it can go beyond the area of agriculture and food into health and other areas as well. And also, interestingly, it also has key features which are very future-oriented, which means that we are talking about the future digital age, artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, big data, all the key features which are driving the second generation uh, internet revolution are already built into this platform, which is very, very important because you know, initiatives come and go, platforms are built and then they are lost. But if you have that, those kinds of features in a platform and in an initiative, then you are, it is likely to survive. Sustainability of initiatives is as important as the current uh, characteristics of any given platform or initiative. So I am very pleased to see. I would like to see if there are any questions or points that someone wants to raise uh, on this. Uh, the, the other uh, important element is that we should not just leave it there, that it has been done and it is available. We should try to become, to make it uh, as widely known, as, as widely accessible as possible not only by our organizations, but also by governments and by communities and uh, organizations around the world. So how to make that happen is also a big challenge. And one of the elements in this uh, day's event is how to make these kinds of things uh, more widely uh, known, available, and used so that uh, they can grow on their own speed and at their own, uh, from their own momentum. So with those words, I would like to thank you once again for this uh, very, very valuable initiative and uh, very future-oriented platform. And uh, that we very much hope that this will grow. And next year, you will come and you say that we have a universal membership in this. <laughs> thank you very much. So I now turn to our friend, Ambassador Paolo Zampoli, who will talk about artificial intelligence. I think uh, you are well known. I don't need to introduce you here in the UN. You have the floor. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Mr. Chair, Madam Sachs, Gloria, thank you for having us here. I'm very honored to be here for this uh, very particular event and uh, this very noble cause. As we talk about the $1 a year, can help people. Two dollars can give food um, to LDC and least developing countries. A, a, a machine can give it even much more than that. A, aid funding for many years has been uh, simply been allocated monies without transparency and accountability. This methodology of giving cash does not empower local economies. New technologies such as AI bring more accountability and deliver sustainability. 
Capturing technology will empower local communities in LDC and increase the GDP for future generations. Farmers can benefit from AI agri-drones and also mobile applications available to sell directly to a consumer rather than going through um, intermediaries. Surveillance drones can help maritime security and domain for fighting illegal fishery that can, uh, can that usually affect Africa's countries for about the 2% of their GDP. Um, drone uh, delivery uh, with uh, doctors are currently using Rwanda. This saves life by delivering es essential medicine supplies. AI uh, will help medicine and education. For example, IBM Watson can process an average of 250,000 images of a patient. No doctor in lifetime can visit 250,000 patients. AI will help to prevent epidemics, optimize resources, and dramatically re reduce the existence of health costs and care. Microsoft with SmartRap is at the forefront of epidemiology and developing system to prevent and predict epidemic outbreaks with the help of AI and mosquitoes. Smart traps collect data of over 100 million samples of mosquitoes. DNA can be analyze and predict future outbreaks. Excellency, I want to thank you, and I look forward to see the engagement of the present stakeholders in the future. Please, again, thank you to have an idea. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zampoli. Thank you for opening the door to the future and to the frontier issues. In, in the area of development. You know, when we talk of artificial intelligence, there are these tremendous opportunities for applications for, of artificial. Now, what is artificial intelligence? It is simply a new way of learning. Learning from data and experience. The more data you have, the more data and information and experience that you have, you feed into the machine, and it becomes better because it learns from its own mistakes. So it, in a sense, artificial intelligence is an extension of how human beings learn. And machines can become artificially intelligent, but with time, the danger is that they may become autonomous intelligence, independent intelligent be beings which are beyond control of humans. That is what Jim Hawkins said, that there is a challenge in there. But I have another dream and vision, listening to Ambassador Zampoli, which is, can we use artificial intelligence to learn about development more smartly, in a more smart way, which means, how can we gather all the data and experience that has been there for the last 70 or 80 years of development experience in developing countries and feed that into artificial intelligence growth so that artificial intelligence can become a tool for smart and autonomous development. That is what Ambassador Zampili was giving examples of how artificial intelligence applications can bring about better results in development, more transparency, more clear, effective outcomes, and learning from there, you keep on doing that uh, uh, in an iterative step-by-step -step process, and this is another example of the same approach. But how can we do it on a large scale? That is what the Secretary General has in mind, the current Secretary General, when he set up this task force on artificial intelligence that how can the UN system use artificial intelligence as a, as a smart and transformative tool to transform development itself. Not only the UN system, that it can learn from its own past experience by gathering data and feeding it into artificial intelligence processes, but also developing countries themselves can do it. And individual communities and individual organizations and individual companies can do it. So, 
there is a tremendous field and scope out there which needs to be explored. We have seen a few examples given by Ambassador Zampoli, but I would like to see this across the board, across the development field, because artificial intelligence is now going on in the private sector mostly, or in the defense sector mostly. How, how wars can be fought for terrorists also. Counter-terrorism. Yeah, counter-terrorism. How, how wars can become, be fought without human beings. That is what artificial intelligence is. How can development be developed, uh, used without, uh, without human interference and uh, resources, money? I, I think it can be, it's a doable dream. So I would leave this thought with, to you and maybe we will have get, get some response, some, some reaction to what I am saying here. Is there anyone who can come forward and say how, how you feel about it, Ambassador Zampoli? Yeah, um, Excellency, thank you. Thank you for your comment. It's fantastic. Uh, people are scared of artificial intelligence. We, we are concerned that uh, we're going to lose jobs, things will be different. Well, the President of the United States uh, cannot support artificial intelligence. There is 2.5 million uh, truck driver. Um, as we know, with autonomous driving cars, all this job might disappear. I mean, the streets will be very safe. Um, autonomous car will reduce incredible the, the risk of accident. Yeah. But still, uh, there is going to be jobs that there are going to be lost in this, but there is going to be no, new job that will be created. Now, we all have a smartphone, and this is called intelligence assistance. It's not artificial intelligence. Yeah. Artificial intelligence is in developing its use. It's very crucially important for counterterrorism. Uh, the way that uh, we can uh, analyze, and also, you know, we've been seeing uh, Mark Zuckerman and Facebook and all this Google that they still have, we, I don't understand why, um, all this data of uh, a terrorist organization, this terrorist propaganda. Uh, there was a famous man that was killed in Yemen few, 12 years ago. His preach are still, were still on Google until a few months ago. But anyway, I'm sorry to, uh, to, uh, to make in this intervention, which is not oh, related no, for uh, um, the core part of this meeting. Uh, but, uh, but on medicine, on uh, education, you know, Madame represents one of the best universities of the world. A few people can go to your university. But artificial intelligence could be remotely deployed for all, all these uh, things, give uh, access to education, which nobody can complain uh, on uh, medicine, as we made, made some example. The video of the leave was exactly the same that uh, um, Watson has a picture of a moment, 250,000 patients. Which doctor can see 250,000 patients? What else? I think. Uh, Counterterrorism is also something that artificial intelligence will make a real difference for face recognition, uh, analyzing all this. But anyway, sorry for this intervention and thank you. Let's go back no, no, to the no. core business. Thank you. No, no, thank you very much. It's not, not at all uh, a digression. It is very much part of the discussion. So let's move to our next panelist, uh, my, my Dr. Sonia Sachs. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Really thrilled to be here. I've been circling around uh, uh, Mr. Saporito, as he knows, uh, for a couple of years, wanting to actually be here. And I'm particularly thrilled that uh, Ms. Gloria Kins is here because not only is she the guardian angel of many of us and of many initiatives, it's actually her cousin, Betsy Parker, uh, who is a, a close partner of ours on a lot of the work that um, my husband Jeffrey Sachs and I are doing. Um, for you guys, it may not be at all relevant that I'm here, but for me, it's unbelievably important that I'm here today because we just published the Millennium Villages project that uh, you so kindly projected on one of the screens. And this is actually our first public um, uh, uh, discussion of the Millennium Villages project. It just got published in the Lancet, the Glo the, the Lancet Global Health um, two days ago. Um, and this is the first time I get to speak about it. Um, Jeff and I are going to Yale tomorrow. Thank you. Um, and we'll uh, talk about it some more, and then there'll be a public launch at the UN. But the reason I'm here and the reason I'm grateful um, is because the um, out of the Millennium Villages, um, we learned many lessons. One of them is 
what were we thinking about 15 years ago when we thought it was possible before we had what really rescued us, which is uh, the absolutely critical component, um, which is ICT. So um, as you may or may not know, the Millennium Villages Project was an idea that Jeff uh, had that came out of the UN Millennium uh, Project um, initiative, which was an initiative to try to do, think about how to reach the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and there were hundreds of uh, um, policy practitioners, scientists thinking about it, and then we wanted to actually learn and show and demonstrate what it would look like on the ground in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, in 10 countries, in very remote rural areas of each of the 10 countries, uh, we did deploy this initiative um, of an integrated rural development approach um, to see if these very poor rural communities could actually have a health system, education system, first and foremost, a source of food uh, production, food security, uh, infrastructure, et cetera. And um, 10 years later, which is two years ago, it took us two years to do the analysis, and it's the analysis that was just published. Um, and in fact, it answers the question that yes, it's complicated, not all, everything went as we, we would have wanted, but it's unbelievably overwhelming, po overwhelmingly positive. But uh, a lack of time and possibly your interest, I want to focus on the health system for which ICT um, and the use of telephony is a sine qua non. Um, it absolutely makes a huge difference. Um, and it's because of that that actually um, four years ago, uh, Jeff and I started a campaign of which I'm the director uh, called the One Million Community Health Worker Campaign. Um, and that's because in the African context, in the rural villages, we, as many other people, realize how absolutely critical it is to have professionalized community health workers, not the volunteer community health workers that by necessity most countries have, um, which is not a policy decision, it's a resource constrained decision that they're volunteers. So we advocate for professionalized community health worker, properly paid, properly supervised, and smartphone empowered. So for 10 years already in the Millennium Villages, um, the community health workers in the 10 countries, that's 500,000 people, um, were using um, regular phone in the beginning and for the last five years, a smartphone with an application called ComCare. So we actually have five, now seven uh, years of experience of how unbelievably transformational a game changer it is for community health workers and therefore the community health system to have the phone. Because of course, as you all know, since you're the ones from whom I learned all this, um, the smartphone can act as number one, as a support, like a, a little peripheral brain to remind the community health worker what to do or not to do at that particular household. It also, of course, serves as a, while servicing the household, it also serves as a repository of data, which you can then analyze. Um, and you know, as the community health worker goes to the household and deals with a pregnant woman or the two-year-old with a diarrhea, um, as the community health worker is dealing with that, they're also collecting uh, invaluable data. And that data, first of all, informs the community manager what is the disease burden. Um, and it tells that in real time. So it's not that a year or two later, by DHS surveys, you see that there was an uptick in um, uh, child death. You see it day by day. So the community health worker manager can say, why were there two cases of bloody diarrhea last week when normally we only see one per month? And so the real-time data of disease burden makes a huge difference in terms of being able to adapt the interventions and adapt the management because, of course, with the GPS, um, the community health worker manager can also see how many households the community health worker does see or not see. Uh, did they do the right thing? Uh, why does it say that the community health worker saw five cases of fever but only did two rapid diagnostic tests? And even though two rapid diagnostic tests were positive, he should have given out two doses of malaria, but it says here he gave out 50 doses of malaria. Maybe there's something nefarious that the community health worker is doing. The phone and the data um, is unbelievably um, helpful, of course, and uh, also, obviously, it's a great way to no uh, notify emerging diseases, new diseases, um, so that unlike 
I'm absolutely convinced that if there were community health workers with a smartphone in the Ebola countries, it, um, there would have been little outbreaks, but there would not be the devastating, tragic um, epidemics. So on the basis of the Millennium Villages Project, which um, uh, terminated two years ago, we're doing all sorts of, interest, I think, interesting um, uh, scale up. One of them is this professionalized community health worker. We're advocating for national scale community health workers with a smartphone. It's a sine qua non, paid and smartphone. Ghana is one of the countries that's taking it up, and they now have 20,000 professionalized government paid community health workers. And I'm in uh, desperate search of phones for them, which is another way I've been bothering Mr. Saporito. I'm looking for phones. Um, we have 8,000 out of the 20,000 that we need, um, and the 8,000 are already deployed and used by the community health workers. Um, the campaign also has, um, um, the campaign also uh, has actually succeeded um, in, besides the fact that Ghana uh, uh, has gone with it, uh, is that at the African Union, um, last summer uh, under the President Conde's chairmanship, um, they adopted, they called the one million CHW campaign, they called it the two million community health worker initiative, and it's now an AU initiative. But of course, it can be an AU declaration, but there is no, no funding behind it. Um, and that's something that Jeff is working on with Kagame, President Kagame, who's now the chair, um, to try to uh, it is Jeff's recommendation that the AU start two new funds, one for health and one for education, specifically Africa-based funds. And the, and the health fund would focus first and foremost on primary care, of which a critical component are these community health workers, which cost $6 per person per year out of a health budget and are transformational in terms of the community's um, well-being. Um, just quickly, the uh, UNAIDS has decided, as many of you know, um, that uh, there should be an end to the epidemic rather than just controlling the epidemic. So they started a new strategy two years ago called 90-90-90, which is that 90% of people who are infected should be aware that they're infected, 90% of those that know they're infected should be on treatment, and 90% of those that are on treatment should be rid of their, should have viral suppression. And Michelle Sidibe and his team um, have realized uh, that without the community health worker, you cannot satisfy the first 90, um, because if you wait until the candidate or until the patient comes to the clinic, identifies himself as uh, wanting to know whether or not he has HIV, by then, he or she has transmitted the disease for years. And so it has to be active case searching um, at the household level. So the UNAIDS 909090 has embraced um, the community health worker campaign. I just want to say one more thing, um, which is that uh, Ghana, in addition to taking on uh, the first of a kind national scale community health worker program paid by the government and empowered by a smartphone, um, also allowed us to scale up, besides that initiative from the Millennium Village, but they've allowed us to scale up the telemedicine program, which started in the Millennium Village in Bonsaso in Ghana, then went to the district, then went to a couple districts, then went to the region of Ashanti, then to a couple regions, and has just last December gone national. There still are some gaps in, in funding, um, but, um, but it's a national scale program. Um, I'm particularly tickled um, to be here at the UN. Thanks to your invitation, Mr. Saporito. I really appreciate it and, and to your generosity. Um, because, of course, this is where the Millennium Villages Project was born, Madagascar um, being one of the, um, the um, class, the typical Millennium Village where it was not the ones that were um, closely monitored um, so that the data could be collected, but it was one of the many that were spun off um, so that there would be local learning, local adaptation, um, different language, and um, um, I actually have not been there for a couple years, but I look forward to uh, looking. So I will stop, but I would like to, since I am a campaigner, uh, I would like to campaign if any of you have any uh, suggestions and ideas um, we really would like to have as many countries as are interested um, do national scale community health workers with a smartphone and specifically 
I'm looking um, for smartphones. Jeff and I went to Huawei. Am I saying it right? Huawei um, in January, and so we're hoping for a partnership with them. But um, we need smartphones because um, it's absolutely a, a game changer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sonia uh, Sachs, for this uh, very illuminating presentation. And it reminds me of uh, my long uh, cooperation and uh, uh, support for Dr. Sachs' uh, Millennium Project. Uh, I was there at its birth at the UN in ECOSOC, and uh, I've worked ever since with uh, Pierre Paolo, we created this, an ICT village, which was also a millennium village in Madagascar. <laughs> so, so we have a long history going back together on this uh, very successful uh, initiative. And we very much hope that this will also scale as much as possible far beyond where it is. Uh, it has been, but uh, it can become also universal. Uh, and I, I, am, I am confident that it will, because there is there is so much rea reality and value in it th uh, that uh, anyone can see and, uh, and benefit. You know? So uh, I think it's only a matter of uh, time and campaigning that uh, the, the, within the framework are now the new SDGs. Uh, it will not only be in the Millennium uh, Village part of it or community use of uh, mobile phone, but ubiquitous use of ICT across the various sectors and uh, various uh, growth points in the economy, the strategic growth element for, for poverty reduction, for job creation, and for future-oriented growth, which, which creates jobs while artificial intelligence or other uh, technology innovations and applications may threaten jobs, but they will always create more jobs than they would threaten. That has been the experience of human history. Right from the day when farmers started inventing agriculture, from uh, hunter-gatherers, we became agriculture uh, farmers. At that time, the, the hunters' jobs were lost. But farmers created more jobs than the hunters uh, ever could create. And that has been going on throughout history. So the history is not going to change. The trajectory of human progress is always and shows that jobs become available more jobs than what the jobs are lost. The textile industry, the uh, internal combustion engine, you look at it, the technology growth is always uh, generates more jobs than it, uh, it makes redundant. So I am confident that uh, this uh, approach can, uh, can be also used. Any, any comments or any suggestions from the floor or question? <coughs> if not, then we can move on to the next uh, set of panelists. Uh, which is the next digital solutions for the UN Agenda 2030 and the African uh, 2063 plan, which is a very big, uh, very long uh, scope plan. Sarpalan, one more per person. If there is any doctor wants to make a comment. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, There's yeah, one more comment, please. Yes, please, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, please introduce uh, yourself. Introduce yourself. Okay. Thanks a lot for accommodating. Uh, me. Uh, I'm Dr. Sad Paracharya. Um, I'm at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, um, and my field is molecular carcinogenesis. Um, I develop tools for detecting micrometastasis of solid tumors. But uh, uh, about 19 years ago, I started an organization called Harlem Children's Society to address issues of uh, poverty and training youth, especially African-American, Hispanic youth in, in our city. And uh, eventually, over a period of time, I started with three students in my, my, I have a laboratory as well at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And then slowly it has spread across the country. So uh, with three students, it grew slowly to about uh, uh, 1,000 students per year. Uh, all selected students, but all below poverty. And spread across the country, many um, uh, uh, American Indians, or, um, and then 25 countries worldwide, mostly in Africa, uh, in Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, uh, Ghana, uh, up in Algeria, uh, and so forth. But we have a strong presence in Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, and, um, and uh, uh, Kenya. 
and then in Malaysia and other places. <coughs> the whole idea is to evolve a hands-on approach to education so that the students learn that here in New York City and other places, at least uh, there are high-tech laboratories and uh, um, excellent uh, mentors, but in, uh, in vast areas, in rural areas of this country itself, in, in, you don't have to go uh, very far, you just have to go maybe th two hours away in New York and you'll, you'll be right in, in a rural uh, neighborhood. And there, sign, uh, science is a big problem. We're losing, uh, you're not creating enough scientists uh, and uh, young kids, not that the uh, kid, is simply because technology also helps in this process, but there are local issues uh, of health, of, uh, uh, of social issues that can be converted into science subjects so that there is an engagement by the students to also learn and contribute. And that's how the program has actually been very effective in Africa, where there are areas where there are HIV AIDS, then TB, and local farming issues, that the students themselves form a part of the research project and solve their own communities. And in places where poverty is so intense that the students, that the kids themselves are involved in their housework or employment, they lose out on education. This way we have convinced the parents that by uh, involving their kids in this kind of approach to education, they also uh, serve to uh, bringing funds into the family. So in the long term, it, it helps uh, economically as well as provide them with, uh, uh, with resources. So this has been growing and then for the last uh, seven years, uh, I've been working on an animation film on climate change from 10,000 years. Just a miracle, please. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the main thing is uh, I encouraged him no, to come and speak. Sit there, sit there. Uh, I'm Gloria Kiddens because he's working with thousands of students under the poverty line. And he has put in himself a tremendous amount of investment in this. And it's the main part of it is, right, he's multi-talented and a brilliant famous doctor, but what he's done for these children under the poverty line, including them, and many of them have become outstanding attorneys, doctors, and professionals. But it's very short notice, and please forgive me, I asked him to come last minute. He's so important, it was hard to catch him. Thank you. She's too kind. Thank you, Gloria, for introducing us to such social entrepreneurs who are doctors, but they are real entrepreneurs. <laughs> Thank we you. We so need much. to give a, a word huh? yes. with you and Gloria. Yes. <laughs> now we we are very honored to give. Uh, Sonia, and as she was telling me, my cousin uh, right now is traveling and seeing three or four presidents uh, on the part of their organization, so it's a family interest also. Uh, uh, my cousin Betsy Parker, who's a reverend, is very involved and in visiting three heads of state right now with the message of the Sachs organization. And I, but I am so proud to have been a part of OCOM from day one. Wow. And it was just lucky yeah. because it so happens that this former <laughs> member of the Italian government, what were you doing then? European Parliament. Human, <laughs> the European <laughs> Parliament, so it's propitious she's here, called me from Italy and said 18 years ago a very famous important, brilliant Italian is coming to New York and he's founding OCOM 
and needs your help. So here we are, Maria Grazia, <laughs> who used to be. Let me be, take a picture of she, you. She was a part no, think, yeah. of the Italian yeah. club. Yeah, you yeah, have to be no. in. You started it. So I came into the story because of Maria Grazia, who was an Italian official. And here we are. <laughs> and uh, thank you. I want to take a picture of you. Yeah, keep it down. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. By the way, this is a surprise for me. Okay, but. Okay. Anywhere, We have a. We have the picture. Okay. But this is an honor, uh, and thank you. And thank you for coming also, Ambassador Zampoli. Thank you very and much. And thank you, everybody who's here that are my so friends fun. for years. Yeah. Thank you. It's thank a you surprise. You, it's Terribly a nice day. surprise. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen at the UN, this is Christopher Smithers. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today at the UN, and I look forward to meeting all of you soon. Right now, I'm involved with a project in South Africa, Mozambique, and some of the surrounding countries to do with research and training for mental health issues. Um, Columbia University's Department of Global Mental Health, through the directorial ship of Dr. Milton Weinberg, is leading the team of experts here. Um, this Global Mental Health Research Studies Fund that has been created um, here in Sub-Sahara Africa as a research hub is called Pride SSA, and it's partnerships and research to implement and disseminate sustainable and scalable evidence-based practices in Sub-Sahara Africa. Pride SSA is a product of a well-established partnership in South Africa, the Foundation for Professional Development and the University of Witwatersrand, Mozambique. Mozambique Institute of Health, Education and Research as well, the Mozambique Ministry of Health, Universidad Eduardo Mondlane, Brazil, Universidad Federal de Sao Paulo, and the United States Columbia University and the University of Pennsylvania. The hub comprises both research and capacity building components. The research component takes place in Mozambique. The capacity building component includes trainees from Botswana, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, and Zambia. Each country will contribute seed teams committed to working together that include all actors needed to develop, test, implement, and sustain community-based services to prevent and treat mental and substance use disorders using evidence-based practices. Training comprises synergistic didactics, hands-on research experience, designed in partnership with local stakeholders, and mentorship from local or U.S. senior investigators. Lessons learned in the scale-up research will be adapted for research in partner countries and other low- and middle-income countries. Now we are bringing all five seed teams together at the University of Witwatersrand 
in Johannesburg for the first training in implementation science. This project is a small example of what we could do in Africa by working together in teams with universities, with foundations, and also this can be done for very little money. There's many other areas that this same type of teamwork can be uh, done with. Not only mental health, that's just one part of what we could do in Africa to help the uh, countries with better health in, in that area. But we could do this with other things. We could do it with water, pure water. We could do this with uh, farming. We could do this with um, just poverty in general. By working with teams on specific goals and trying to focus on one area at a time, we could do this all throughout Africa, uh, from country to country, working together, working with universities, working with foundations. And today at the UN, Pier Paolo Separito, my colleague, will explain to you the larger picture of furthering this conference um, that's going on at the UN and using the example uh, of Pride SSA as one of the ways we could achieve um, great things for Africa. Um, I look forward to working with you all and uh, please uh, you can contact me at cbsmithers at icloud.com. Um, Pier Paolo Separito has my uh, other contact information and hopefully this is the start of great things to come for Africa. Thank you all very much and look forward to meeting you all in person one time. Soon. Thank you. Thank you for this video uh, message. I recall very distinctly last year that Mr. Smithers was here and they had introduced the project at that time. I'm so glad to see that it is actually now on the ground in Africa. Yes. And uh, the teams are already working, and uh, the University of Columbia is actively leading the process. And I think we have this wonderful uh, ability to produce synergy among various initiatives and projects, that teams uh, can come together and groups can come together using platform of info poverty and OCAM as, as the networking uh, platform for making things scale up and come together and produce more and more results. What, what we need to do is see results on the ground. SDGs is a very, very big and very ambitious uh, global uh, agenda and framework. And unless we scale up and produce uh, results together on a large scale, they are not going to be achieved. And this is the theme that we have now in front of us because we are now going to talk about next digital solutions. And we have two very brilliant and beautiful ladies with us in this, in this panel. And I would like to, great player, to give the floor first to Ms. Elena Scanferla, who is the Senior Managing Director of ACRA. You have the floor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, it's a hon honor to be here in, at the United Nations. For me, it's the first time, and also for my organization. Um, I'm here to. I'm here to represent Fondazione Acra, which is an Italian NGO. Uh, we were created in 1968, and 2018 is a very important year because we celebrate the 15th anniversary, and we managed to get to the United Nations. So it's a big You're achievement. Um, we mainly works in we mainly work in rural areas. Uh, and we try to bring a sustainable solution in order to eradicate poverty and achieve uh, um, sustainable impact. Um, we try to help communities to uh, reach resilience and we always work in coordination with local authorities, local government, in line which, uh, with what they are the, their policies and development strategies. 
And we try to build a strong relationship and partnerships with local governments, the academic sector, the private sector, and obviously also the um, local civil society organizations. Uh, ACRA nowadays is working in 14 developing countries, and we mainly work in the field of education, war, war, water and sanitation, energy and environment, and food security and sovereignty. Sorry. Um, today I would like to talk about a program, a water program that we are developing in Senegal. Uh, which is uh, named One House, One Tap. And the objective of this program is to bring safe drinking water and sanitation services for rural communities. We work in um, Ziginsha region uh, in four rural communities, and we reach almost 60,000 ben 60, beneficiaries. Um, it's a project, a program that started in 2005 and we are developing in three phases, and we are trying to engage several donors and uh, partners. As you can see um, underneath, we, we engage the, the European Union, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Italian companies, French partners, obviously the Ministry of Water and Sanitation in Senegal, and the PEPAM program, which is the uh, gover governmental program in Senegal to reach um, Water, safe drinking water and sanitation for all. <coughs> the main activities of uh, this one tap, one house um, project is to bring infrastructures. So it means to build a reservoir, build a pipeline, and get to the tap in each house. Uh, we are trying to implement the water safety plans which are, um, it's a tool or risk assess management on safe drinking water promoted by the World Health Organization. And this particular tool is very important because uh, it helps to, ass to assess risk, identify responsibility, identify what are the action to be taken in case of certain risks uh, are verified, and then take actions. Um, yes, you can go on. We also, this is an example of uh, pipes that we are bringing to the households. Uh, those are the sanitation campaign. We develop also behavioral change campaign in order to um, try to uh, um, promote good uh, hygiene and wash practices at household level and also in schools and in communities. Behavioral change campaign are made of um, community activity like radio campaign or events in the villages and also household uh, visits. This is an example of the water safety plan um, that helps to evaluate, prevent, and apply the risk management. Those are, those are the risks that are identified. So the level uh, where are identified at capture level, stockage level, or distribution level, the danger, the risk associated, and the level of risk. And this is the app we, we implemented. Uh, we developed an app which, is very, which has been very useful for us during this program from the beginning of the program, so the, identif the, the identification process of this project um, until the very end of the project, uh, the post-evaluation and also the maintenance and monitoring. Um, this app allows us to uh, collect data from uh, water points up to 200 water points per day. Uh, and the data we can collect are the water points, the characteristics, and the position of the pipes and of the intersections, uh, the user's information, so how many families are there uh, connected to that tap, how many family members, age, sex, if there are seasonal workers, if there are public infrastructures, so if there are school health centers, if there are latrines available, and the risk factors that could be threatening the safety of water. Uh, the project staff uh, collects the data at household level. 
with an iPad or a tablet or a, or a cell phone, and he also needs a GPS. So normally it's the field officer, and uh, afterwards, while, while, the project, while the project is evolving, will be the technician from the local users association. All data are, are organized and harmonized after they are collected by a technical person, which will uh, introduce those data in a database. This database will be then transferred into a map. It's very important to visualize the map uh, because it helps also the people, the, especially the safety plan committee, to adopt measure and to understand. Because if you can, if, if you can visualize it, um, it's going to be easier to understand which could be the solution. This is the network, the outreach of the network that I was talking about. And, and those are the risks that have been identified. So, um, for example, if the risk identified it is contamination of a reservoir, um, once the uh, risk is detected and is put into the system, it will be uh, visualized on the map. And then the safety, the water safety plan committee will study the map and identify the solution. For example, if the problem was the contamination of the reservoir, um, they could see, they could identify if there is an intersection somewhere, stop the water there and try to get the water from the other, inter from the other reservoir. Um, for us, um, digital platforms are very important, and from our experience, um, they, are, they are very important in all the phases of the project cycle management uh, because they can help to, um, to identify needs, to identify risks, to identify how performing we are, so how much um, we have achieved of our objective on real, in real time because as we are collecting data, we can also uh, measure our performance. And also maintaining uh, the system we, we put in place. So once we uh, phase out, when we exit the particular project, the idea is to leave the app, these, all this information, to the local government that can keep using it to maintain, actually, uh, the whole system. And also, for example, if, they, if there is another family moving in, they, they will have all the information to see if there is enough water or how to bring the water to this other family. Um, I would say that a role of NGO is uh, important because we can partner with uh, experts that help us to develop and to find the, the right technology we need and debug on the field. Because when we develop a technology, then you have to test it. And we can be there to test the technology and also help uh, the local authority, the local partner, to understand the value of it and uh, help, help them to, be, to get, uh, get the ownership of that, of that technology. And this type of technology is very easy to be implemented all over the country. So we work in these four communities, but it would be very useful also to use it in the other, in the other uh, villages and also in other projects. Um, and this type of platform, of digital platform, could be useful also in other sectors. For example, in Chad, we build a cereal bank, and we, cereal banks all over the region and we, will, we, we use the same, the same type of uh, uh, platform in order to monitor how many cereals were stored, were, sto were stocked, and in order to um, manage the coming in and coming out of cereals. So um, I think it's, uh, there are many ways to, to adopt and improve the efficiency of projects and intervention in terms of in fields like education, agriculture, irrigation, sustainable water use for agriculture. Um, just to conclude, I would say that technology is very important because it uh, helps us to reach people that are normally excluded, so it's, very, it's inclusive and help, help us to reach people in rural areas where normally not even the governments 
sometimes manage to reach. So it's, a, it's definitely inclusive and um, are an important asset for NGO and, lo and local governments uh, to build sustainable development, to measure their, their impact, to be accountable and to be transparent. And, and I think that an occasion like this one is very important because it helps to get to know uh, good practice and example of projects and partners that are working on similar technologies and learn from each other and also understand which are the possibility and the risk related to technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elila, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation on this project. And what, I, what struck me was the similarity of characteristics of your project and the e-center and many of the other initiatives that we have been listening to this, this afternoon. And uh, one has to find ways and explore how we can bring about the convergence that is needed to make all these projects and initiatives scalable, adaptable, usable, as we move forward on the, on the SDGs. So that is the big challenge that we all have. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Julia Juafra, uh, who will also, who is board member and marketing director of Iritech Group. You have the floor. Good evening, my name is Julia Juafra uh, from Iritech. Uh, I would like to thank you um, Pierpaolo Saporito, uh, President of Occam, for this uh, special opportunity. It's my first time uh, in uh, UNF quarter. What we do? Iritec is born in, uh, in Italy in uh, 1974 and is now one of the leaders in, uh, in worldwide in deep irrigation system. We reach of uh, 140 countries worldwide, uh, thanks also to our manufacturing and commercial branches. We have the headquarters in Italy and branches in Spain, in Germany, Algeria, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and USA. How we can help? Uh, one of the UN goals is food security and climate change is putting uh, a lot of pressure on natural uh, resources uh, and uh, is increasing risk associated to drought and floods. And the target is uh, by 2030 assure sustainable food production system and implement resilient agriculture practices that increase productivity and production. Our vision and mission is to help uh, and to make life easier to, to the farmers, and we aim to ensure that every drop is spent as well as possible, minimizing the ecological footprint. We have a brief, very brief video to give you an overview of our company. And according to FAO, by the year 2050, the world population is expected to grow to 9.7 billion. So global demand for agricultural and energy production 
mainly food and electricity is expected to increase by around 60% for food and 80% for electricity by 2025. So drip irrigation can help to save water and increase agricultural productivity. This method, drip irrigation, allows to distribution of water and uh, um, and the nutrition solution in small quantities and more frequently to keep the ideal moisture level to the root zone. So this gives us different benefits. Uh, the first benefit of drip irrigation is less water. We have the higher efficiency, uh, around 90% of efficiency, sometimes uh, in case of sub, sub uh, uh, irrigation, we, have, we, we can reach 95% uh, of efficiency. With other systems, like sprinkle system, we have an efficiency around of 70%, and uh, with the traditional, the, the surface, um, the flood uh, irrigation, we have around 30-35%. So, this means that uh, drip irrigation, in comparison with uh, a rain irrigation, uh, we, we can save around 22%, and uh, drip irrigation versus flood, we can save around 45%. So it's a big saving. Another, another um, benefit is a higher yield and healthier plants. Drip irrigation can increase crop yield by uh, till 90% uh, compared with, uh, with the surface irrigation. Other benefits are less energy, less fertilizer, around 28% of saving, reduce risk of disease, because um, risk of disease because uh, um, we keep uh, the foliage dry, so uh, um, with the control also because we um, we wet only around the plant. And another benefit is allows for utilization of saline water. Some data of drip irrigation we have. Uh, in all the world, uh, all over the world, in uh, we um, is, is, is uh, 324 million are the hectares equipped for irrigation. And the gravity system is the most dominant one. Um, it's around 75% of the total, total irrigated area. While the sprinkle irrigation is around 32 million hectares with 10%, and micro, -irri micro irrigated area is about 8 million hectares, 2.5%. Uh, among this micro irrigation, the drip irrigation counts uh, the uh, 61%. Drip irrigation market is a project to be the fastest growing irrigation market with a growing rate uh, of uh, around 18% by now to 2023. These are the essential drip irrigation components, drippers, veils, polyethylene tubing, fittings, and filters. Um, also, we have the digital part, the fertilization and automation. Uh, drip irrigation can also be used to apply fertilizer in liquid forms, reducing the application of excess uh, nutrients and increasing crop, crop yields. This give us other benefits, minimize nitrogen volatilization, reduce uh, the tractor passes, so less labor and uh, less full uh, requirements, and also uh, increase the uniformity of fertilizer distribution. So for these components, we need a project. And Iritec, what, what does he do? Um, starts with the survey and then design, supply of components, installation, startup test and training. Uh, how can we do a design of a project? Um, depends of uh, different characteristics. The characteristic of the water, the soil, the crops, what well, kind of, of crop, 
the topography and um, and the climate of course so uh, with all these characteristics we will make a design to decide which kind of fi filtration to put and uh, what kind of components uh, and so on but what is very important the most important things to to train not only training of the farmers but to train some to create some professionals, to, to create, create some skills, um, to, have, to give some people to the farmers that can be their point of reference. This is uh, <laughs> very important for the, to, to ensure the longevity of a project. Here we have some example of a complete irrigation system that we made. Uh, this is in China. 9,000 hectares of drip irrigation system. This is another one in Armenia. And then uh, in Tanzania and Senegal. So it was for onion uh, mixed vegetables. This is a greenhouse gr hydroponic uh, system in Indonesia. And in Kazakhstan. And in Italy, this is very interesting because we collect uh, the rain water uh, in the reservoir to uh, reuse it for depregation. What we think is that, that our mission fits perfectly with the main purpose of World Food Security Center and the UN uh, goals, the sustainability, sustainable development goals of UN. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. We have the example of presentation one by an NGO, improving water uh, nutrition, water uh, sanitation, and another one saving water by drip irrigation from the private sector. So it's a perfect match, and uh, we have the e-center, and now I will, I'm not going to use more time because I think we are running out of time. I would like to give the floor to Mr. Ivan Shimkov, who is a CEO of and founder, a CEO and founder architect of Building Academy. Thank you. So maybe we'll have another convergence here. <laughs> Although very different field. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's no. This microphone? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's it is. Working, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I think if I do. Oh, okay. High tech. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here and. Many thanks to my dear colleague, the architect Pier Paolo Soporito, for the honor to present here uh, the work of Build Academy. And many thanks to my dear friend Rehan Chaudhry, who uh, actually invited me to be here on his behalf and who could not be unfortunately here with us because of a medical emergency. So my name is Ivan Shomukov. I'm the CEO and founder of Build Academy. We're based in New York. I'm an architect, um, engineer, entrepreneur, and professor at the NYU, New York University. I started Build Academy five years ago, which is a, a startup company, a platform for professional solutions in the building industry. And what we do is education on one side, building culture and, and creating upscaling people around the world who are working in our industry, in architecture, real estate, construction, uh, and also product manufacturing. And at the same time, we also do, uh, we are also a marketplace for solutions in the industry, where we connect the different constituents in the industry. You, probably most of us live in uh, beautiful cities like New York, Milan, and other nice places around the world, but you probably don't realize 
that 90% of the world lives in substandard conditions. And they are often exposed to natural disasters and they're often exposed to unlivable conditions. So it's interesting that uh, among the seven plus billion people living on, on our planet, there are over six billion people who live in substandard conditions. And this often costs them their life. As you know, quality shelter and healthy environment are basic standards also by the United Nations in which we are very fortunate to be uh, reconvening today. Our work in the past years has focused uh, a lot on collaborating with organizations like the United Nations, the World Bank, in developing solutions for smart and resilient cities. We work particularly on SDG 11, Sustainable Development Goal 11, for um, smart, resilient, and sustainable cities. This is the recent picture from Dominica. We had the ambassador of Dominica just recently here. This is a picture from the hurricane in Dominica, which uh, hit in uh, November of last year, and people were still reco recovering after that, and it's still a major disaster. In places like Haiti or Philippines, who, we, who had um, earthquakes and, and uh, uh, tsunamis and uh, typhoons, five years ago, some of them 10 years ago, they still haven't recuperated. So at Build Academy, our mission is to empower professionals and companies to learn, collaborate, and build better. As a marketplace, we're connecting the different constituents in the industry. And there is the, uh, our solution to info poverty. There are just so many people in the industry who are incredibly skilled, However, they live in places that don't have access, don't give them the opportunity to intervene on these projects where they're mostly needed. On the other side, in places like China, for example, there is one architect on every 10,000 people living. In places like Italy, there is one architect for every 400 people. All right, so, <laughs> so, you know, somehow we need to have a way to match the supply and the demand of global talent, all right? So that's why we're connecting our main clients, our governments and real estate developers. We connect them with the designers who are the architects, engineers, the investors, the global financial capital, the contract and the product manufacturers. And because of this connection between the different parts of the industry, we have completely reinvented the way that procurement in, in the building industry works. Traditionally, 80% of the projects of the United Nations actually end up in failure because of their inefficient procurement process. 80% of many other projects in our industry end up in failure because there is a mismatch between the demands and the needs, the demands of the clients, the need of the ultimate customer, which is society, and then the solutions which are provided by the companies in the industry. Therefore, we have completely reinvented the process so instead of you know, this very inefficient way of uh, finding companies that execute on projects, we have created something that's called crowd-solving challenges. All right? So we, can, we work with local communities, we work with representatives of the client, we work with global experts, we work with companies and professionals from all over the world who can actually execute on uh, these projects. So far, we have, uh, this is how the process actually works. The client comes to us, they tell us what the problem is. All right, you always need to start with a problem in a business. They tell us what the problem is. Sometimes they have a piece of land that needs to be built, or sometimes they need to develop a, a project for a smart city, or sometimes they need a technological solution. They come to us, we do the uh, feasibility study, this, the concept design and the planning for the entire process. And then we invite professionals and companies who are experts in the industry to solve this problem. We work with them over a period of two to three months in which we develop hundreds of solutions. We guide them in the process. And then with the help of international jury, we select carefully the best proposals. We make a recommendation to our clients which are the ones that are uh, most appropriate for the implementation, and we help the client actually build them, uh, achieving the impact that's needed by society and achieving the results that our clients are seeking. Um, 
in the past, we've worked on projects like um, emergency shelters for um, areas affected by natural disasters, refugee camps around Syria, um, resilient schools for the Philippines, smart and resilient housing for Nepal and uh, Haiti, um, solar lights for an uh, NGO called Liter of Light, and we're currently working with the World Bank on a project for a resilient housing. So the key benefit of our unique solution is that we align the projects with new technologies. We develop global innovative solutions. We give our uh, clients wide exposure and global outreach. And most importantly, we build a global grassroots movement. So the solution is instead of being imposed from the top down, they actually are being built from the bottom up with the participation of the community. Um, currently, we have over 60,000 professionals, 15 experts who are actively collaborating on our projects, 12 partners and universities, and global reach on any continent. This is an example of work that we did with the UNHCR in emergency shelters uh, in areas affected by floods or uh, hurricanes. We also work with the Department of Education in the Philippines for des designing resilient schools, and this is just one of the examples, by the way, designed by a team from Milan, very successful projects using local technology. In this case, it was built with bamboo. And this is a, a house, a resilient house, which we developed for Nepal and other mountain areas affected by natural disasters. We are currently launching uh, a project with the World Bank, and this is in fact the first time I announced this because we confirmed the project two days ago. So with the World Bank, we're building a global consortium of governments, companies, NGOs, uh, United Nations, and uh, a number of individuals who are experts in this field and who are passionate about providing the world with resilient, sustainable, and smart housing. So the challenge will uh, officially launch at the end of May and will conclude by the end of July. And then by the end of the summer, we'll select the best projects, the prototypes, and we'll implement some of them on site. And these will be actually used as, as kind of guidelines for uh, the World Bank and other organizations to rebuild communities that have been destroyed by natural disasters. We're currently working on, on areas with typhoons and floods, earthquakes, fires, war and climate migration. I'm just going to go directly to the end. So with this, I would like to uh, invite you, if you have any interest in rebuilding, any interest in providing the world with resilient shelters and, and creating better communities and, and healthier living environments to reach out to us. And I'll be happy to partner with all of you as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis Shokov, for this very interesting presentation. I must mention to you that on 20th of June this year, uh, with the uh, UN Habitat, uh, the UN uh, Organization for Human Settlements, UN Habitat, and uh, the Consortium of uh, Sustainable Urbanization, we are organizing a big event here in New York at the United Nations on how we can advance uh, uh, glo uh, goal 11 on sustainable cities and human settlements with the use of information and communication technology. So I would very much like to welcome you and your team to come and participate and possibly do a presentation and uh, connect with other people with the American Institute of Architects and the New York Institute of Architects is actively involved. And the Barcelona-based uh, organization of mayors uh, of the world uh, is also involved. I'm forgetting the name. But uh, I thought that I would mention that to you and I would like uh, all of us to, to engage uh, in, in making your uh, initiative uh, globally known. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you Thank you very much. Okay, so we have now six more presentations to go, and now it is uh, close to five o'clock. So I'm going to request uh, all the presenters to be, yeah, to be a little bit uh, precise and brief. Uh, the, uh, because, and then, Mr. Yeah, yeah. 
after this? It's me. After Mr. Kimura. Uh, yes. Yeah, Kimura. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, un, uh, I think in my view, the program is so tight, the time is so tight that we are not going to have the time for this round table among the chairs. I think the round table should be with all of us together <laughs> to, to, to cross fertilize the ideas and think of how, what are the elements that we are going to put, put into the, the final declaration of this, uh, this event, the conference. So please think and give us your uh, feedback and, uh, uh, and ideas so that we can incorporate and then share it with you when, when we finalize the draft document. I think my boss is calling me also. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> no, but we'll, we'll continue. So my next uh, presentation is uh, by Mr. Kimura, Mikio Kimura, who is the CEO of Taurus. You have the floor, sir. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I really appreciate uh, to have a, a chance to explain my um, uh, experience. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, how did I uh, found um, the future of the society in the uh, Estonian e-government system. Well, today I want to talk about, uh, well, uh, introduction of uh, Taurus, uh, who you are and what we do, and also uh, why uh, uh, we Japanese at the venture uh, uh, get uh, interested in the, uh, Estonia. And then uh, uh, I want to take a look at the uh, uh, competitiveness of Estonia and <coughs> what's the key success factors of Estonia, and then how the, the government react and take a, uh, uh, the leadership uh, uh, against it, yeah? Okay, the first of all, uh, uh, introduction of Taurus. Uh, about who you are, uh, about my uh, mm, the background. I used to work for the, the Japanese, the banking, uh, the uh, mega banking system, and now I'm an entrepreneur of the Japan, and my focus is, uh, uh, financial technology and real estate technologies. Both two things are connected uh, in behind. Yeah. And our company, uh, Taurus, uh, really focus on the, uh, the real estate technologies. Uh, we take a look at the, um, uh, the real estate and the registry system. Uh, we uh, assemble the real estate uh, real, uh, real estate um, <coughs> the registry, and uh, uh, well, <coughs> okay, um, the, the real estate registry, uh, if you take a, uh, this registry, take a look at from the vertical side, it is obviously uh, the real estate data, but if you look at this uh, from the vertical, uh, horizontal side, it is uh, individual data. So uh, we, um, uh, assembled a bunch of uh, real estate registry and split it and flatten and put it into the database and then create the big data. And then uh, by analyzing it, we can find out what's gonna happen in the near future for the uh, particular individuals. It, it's like a, almost like a, uh, the Panama document. Yeah, so and then uh, we are using an, uh, artificial intelligence to analyze it uh, so that we can be uh, uh, another real estimate, uh, real estate uh, Google. That's what, what we are doing. So, in other words, uh, Taurus is visualizing real estate information and uh, uh, create, uh, uh, making a <coughs> uh, uh, the marketing uh, consultation. That's what we do. Yeah. Uh, our client is uh, uh, big financial the companies and the real estate the companies. 
Oh, it's funny though. Sorry. So, hmm. yeah. And also, <clears throat> uh, in Japan, uh, the real estate market, the transaction is so huge, but uh, the efficiency is very low uh, because everything is uh, uh, processed by the papers. And uh, it means um, almost everything is, um, transparency is very low, and it's almost uh, the black box. And so uh, there is, and uh, uh, asymmetry of data is everywhere. So uh, that creates an, an equality and the poverty. That's the problem. So I wanted to improve this, uh, the problem. So, but uh, uh, in order to do this, uh, improvement uh, in the digital innovation uh, was necessary. But uh, making an effort by individual uh, the com uh, company doesn't mean anything. Uh, this kind of the, um, improvement must be uh, done by, uh, the, as a social uh, infrastructure. So I was uh, wanted a good crew to rectify these situations, and uh, eventually I found the, uh, uh, the case in Estonia. Estonia is uh, uh, doing very good, and this is a, a very thick um, the savvy government. So uh, take a look at Estonia capability. Yeah, Estonia is located on oh, sorry. Estonia is located this uh, the Nordic uh, Sea and area, and the capital city Tallinn uh, is look like this. It's very urbanized, but uh, if you take a look at the, the other areas, uh, the city has very medieval taste. Uh, it's very uh, good city. Well, the fact of Estonia, the index of Estonia. Uh, Estonia uh, has uh, only 1.3 uh, million uh, the peoples. It's very tiny uh, countries. But uh, Estonia is very competitive. For instance, uh, the tax competitiveness is uh, the number one. And also, uh, the easiness of the, the business is highly ranked. And uh, the, uh, the digital index is very uh, highly ranking as well. Everything is uh, processed online, uh, except for uh, Mary and Debos. And uh, uh, everything has uh, become easy uh, because uh, uh, everything is processed in the, uh, the, uh, the digitally. Uh, for instance, the voting uh, system is uh, uh, the processed uh, online. This is the first uh, the country uh, in, the, in the world. So uh, many things uh, become efficient, uh, such as, um, uh, okay, for instance, uh, the voting was uh, uh, the, uh, processed online, and also um, uh, uh, well, uh, so this is a uh, uh, time and uh, uh, the cost and reduced. Uh, it's almost 2% of the, the GDP. Uh, this is reduced. Yeah. And uh, every people has an ID card, and uh, everything is get connected uh, with this card uh, from uh, uh, the hospital uh, medical, uh, medical information, and uh, 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 et cetera. Sorry. And every data is uh, <clears throat> uh, every data is uh, uh, get through uh, with the uh, the internet. This is called X road. So, uh, in that case, um, uh, the security is very important. The data is secured uh, with the blockchain. Uh, this this blockchain is dedicated system, and that is created uh, in uh, the Estonia. Uh, high-tech companies. So they are very confident about the security of uh, the policies. Right. And, and the, uh, I want to take a look at the, uh, the key factor uh, of the, the rapid growth of Estonia. 
Well, uh, look, uh, take a look at, uh, look at the history. Estonia uh, get the independence from USSR in 1991. Yeah. At that time, uh, they have no sufficient money, so uh, they have no sufficient budget to uh, invest uh, to a giant um, the vendors. So they have, uh, that means they had to uh, build everything uh, from scratch. Uh, from outside, uh, it looks that uh, Estonia has a kind of uh, made a kind of uh, uh, the quantum leap, uh, but actually it, it's not. Uh, the progress was uh, made step by step. Well, so, uh, what made it possible for Estonia to bring about such a rapid growth? Uh, there are so many elements to suppose that's, uh, the success. But uh, the time is limited, so I want to pick up just one thing uh, to uh, put the, uh, the biggest impact on Estonia. From my uh, entrepreneur's point of view, I'd like 